Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Joe Wingard. I'm from the Bucks County Herald, and I'm pleased to welcome you to the PNA Community Newspaper Forum. As media leaders, you're exploring various options to continue to save your community's information needs while also facing new economic constraints. Uh, many of the fellow newspapers are finding success by shifting from traditional for-profit model to a nonprofit organization. Today, we are joined by a team of experts to discuss the nonprofit model as an option. I want to welcome our speakers today, Sue Cross, the Executive Director at the Institute for Nonprofit News, Dan Haley, co-founder of Growing, media, uh, Growing Community Media, and Don Kramer, the chair of the nonprofit law group at Montgomery McCracken Walker and Rhodes. Thank you to each of you for participating today. And you can find the uh, speaker's full biographies on today's event page. Examining new nonprofit models is an, an essential exercise for any news media organization. Last year, my company decided to make a change from private family ownership to a, a nonprofit model of ownership for several compelling reasons. One is it enables us to seek additional funding to support journalism outside of advertising and subscription revenue. Another is that it has enabled us to create a legacy plan to ensure continued coverage uh, of the news in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. To start today's discussion, I'm happy to pass the conversation to Sue Cross. Sue, what do you think the news leaders on this call need to know about the nonprofit news model? Hi, everybody, and really glad to be with you this morning. Thanks for that intro, Joe. Um, I grew up typesetting a newspaper in, in the basement of my home, which doubled as my dad's um, preprint production shop. So I literally grew up in newspapers and, and deeply love them. Um, I spent most of my career at Associated Press um, and now run the Institute for Nonprofit News, which is just fun and crazy maddening as is everything in media right now, right? But let's go tell you a little bit about INN because you may not have heard of it. it formed in 2009 as a consortium of investigative news organizations that could see that investigative news was getting cut and was going to get cut much more deeply given the economics of newspapers, which do most of the investigative reporting. It sounds has really uh, taken on a broader mission of supporting all nonprofit news organizations in the U.S., some in Canada and Mexico. Um, and it's, it goes beyond being an association, although it has aspects of that. When I say here that INN is a network, it, in the nonprofit world, this networking is what's enabling startups to survive. It changes the economics. They share things very, very materially. Uh, it's less competitive uh, than the traditional print world. Um, so our members themselves, they share all their data as an open book. They share um, their financial plans, you know, very deeply. And then we do a great deal of training and support to help journalists become publishers in this new mode. It's a different kind of role as an executive director or publisher. We provide shared services. And over the last few years, we've helped about a dozen organizations, including Dan's, convert from for-profit to non-profit. Some of those are digital natives that started as for-profit and converted, and now we are getting a lot more queries from newspapers. Um, a couple of things I'd note, uh, first of all, I would, uh, you know, thank you for watching this video or being here. We really appreciate that publishers exploring this care so much about their communities that they want to see if the newspaper can continue as a service, as a legacy, even if the economics aren't there to support it. The second thing I'd note is um, we're not in the, the kind of vein of this is just that people ignored a digital transition. The truth is, is that the smartest newspaper publishers in the world are all affected by the same thing. It, this is a market failure. There's a transition of much of news coverage to being a public good. And um, I encourage newspaper publishers to have that discussion with their community because sometimes they can 
say, I'm, I'm not sure how to present this. Does it look like it's just a, a, a business failure and we're trying to transition that way? So if we can ever provide context that this is not about an individual business, this is a global issue, we are happy to do that with your supporters as you explore this with your community. Um, a few of the things I would say, um, you know, talking about community, you'll hear me say that a lot. You are all, are all local, you're in your communities, but when you become a nonprofit, that relationship does change further. It, it's deeper, and I think Dan will talk about this as well. You're going to the community to ask for support and saying, this is now yours like the library, like the high school booster, sports booster club, you know, there's a sense of community ownership rather than your um, ownership. And that does change the relationship in a kind of cool way. People will always say, does, does that, you know, does it interfere with our independence? And we haven't found that because people have guidelines to prevent that, but it does involve the community more in your business. And the successful conversions start with asking the community, what do you need? Building a very strong pool of evangelists and supporters. They might potentially be your new board, but it goes beyond that because you're going to be asking the, you're not selling a product, you are asking the community to support you. Um, and so you want to start, even if as you're in these early discovery phases, really building a broad, uh, evangelical base, if you will. Um, let me, let's go through the next few slides. I'm just going to run you through the economics of what it looks like for nonprofit newsrooms. Um, they tend to be a little more narrow or focused than your general community newspaper. So you'll see 64% of them cover a range of topics, but they often don't have the economics, and this is part of the shift, to cover everything in the community. So often you'll find the nonprofits going to the community and saying, what is least covered? What's most important? And then they really concentrate the, their coverage on, you'll see that hardy group about a third on several related topics. Um, that might be in one community, it might be environmental issues. In another, it might be small business economic issues, but they'll tend to really double down on, a, on the coverage that matters most. And some of the other things may go by the wayside or switch to being community produced like coverage of prep sports and so forth. Um, the primary mission for nonprofits, you do see more investigative or deep analytic coverage. It's just the heritage of how they grew and it's often the coverage that's been lost. Um, and it's coverage that can be grant funded and it's harder to support it with advertising. So for all those reasons, that's why you'll see that mission very little. Again, most of these are very small. Generally, they have revenue of under 500,000. They're very, very lean. They're just producing original content in these key areas. They don't have production. Um, many of them don't have bricks and mortar. Um, they are out in the public. They will work in coffee shops. They'll work remotely in, the, in there, but they're very visible. They do a lot of public events. Let's go to the next slide, Matt. How are they funded? The big question, right? So this is the mix. The thing I would point out, um, because it's small, that foundation funding is still fairly small. We uh, just had an event with national funders yesterday to talk about how to increase funding for local, because for all the concern about local, local actually gets less grant funding than the, the bigger national nonprofits. Um, many of these in the local realm are coming through community foundations, family foundations, um, they might be foundations that want to support coverage of an issue. They might be uh, supporting strong education in your state or equity issues, that kind of thing. Um, the important thing I would say about this graph, it's of course static here, but this is moving. The secret in this is growing that individual giving pie. That's really, and you're seeing grants are there as a catalyst. Uh, a lot of newspapers ask, well, I want to convert to get grants. I'm going to come back to that because it isn't the silver bullet you might think it 
is. It can be a, a catalyst and a support there, but the secret is still going to be going back and getting people, your subscribers, but also larger patrons to individually support you and get the community to support you. Um, earned revenue in locals is a mix of advertising, but again, a lot of events, they took a hit. This is 2020 revenue, so it may be a little suppressed here. A lot of them took a hit on in-person events. Some of them do training programs, they run youth programs, whole basket of things in that earned revenue pie. Let's keep going. Audience reach, you can see these are, they tend to be small, but we saw insane levels of growth last year in both people going to websites. They really became the mainstays of COVID information. Um, and then we're seeing really significant growth in newsletters. And those are um, the two main channels. The other thing that I actually think is um, a little bit lower than what I suspect it is, is this mix of direct and mainly through third parties. Because as most of you may know from working with Spotlight PA or Public Source in Pittsburgh, they generally share all their content with all media across the state. So there is this strong relationship between the nonprofits and the for-profits already it, through distribution. The nonprofits are producing content, many of the newspapers, broadcasters, and so forth help disseminate that. Going ahead. Right. So when we look at this, we are, you know, again, we're not doctrinaire about nonprofit is, is inherently better than for-profit for journalism, but it it's small, but it's stable and sustainable. There is this, um, stability to these things. Once they get launched or once they convert, it is working. And we're seeing that individual and community support grow over time. They are don't, many of them get ad revenue, but they're not as reliant on it. And um, so we think this is a really strong avenue for newspapers as well as startups. Um, a couple of considerations around this. Um, we are often asked, as I said, about grants. I think in my next slide, I just put uh, one word on it, trust. We are often asked by for-profits that are struggling to figure out what to do with the current company. And I think Don is going to talk about, you know, can you donate it? Can you sell it? That's highly individual. But around trust, there is a whole basket of questions coming up around can I stay a for-profit and still get foundation grants? Can I, instead of converting, can I be a hybrid? Um, can I just create a little nonprofit subsidiary around the kind of coverage that makes me bleed money and doesn't bring in revenue? That's usually deep explanatory beat coverage or investigative. And yes, you can do all those. Um, and we are seeing some of that. but. I put out a few cautionary notes around this. Um, there, we were talking, be chatting before the call, the importance of transparency in the nonprofit world is so, so important because if you're donating money and as a company, if you're getting a tax break, the government requires you to be more transparent than a for-profit company. And so that transparency is key as we're also seeing, it's becoming more and more important in news. So whatever you do, we all know the challenges of trust in media. You want to do it in such a way that you're building the public trust in your community rather than doing something that people may not understand or they think you're trying to act like a nonprofit but still running as a for-profit. Um, and so there, there are ways to do that. I think you do, you, you can create boards that are still controlled by the owners, but the best nonprofits build broad boards that actually reflect the trust in the community and that helps build support for them. They actually may get grants initially, but to transition to that long-term sustainability, I'd suggest just really biting that off and transitioning. Um, rather than trying to just address it as a tax status or staying ad-based 
but adding something on. The third consideration for the long term beyond trust is just, as you guys know, running any business is really challenging. When you're trying to run a hybrid, you're running two really difficult businesses, the for-profit and the nonprofit. So it can seem like an, a good transition idea, but it may it may end up being more work um, than you thought. And um, I think that's it for me. I just, I'll stop there. And um, Matt, I'm not sure if we're going through all the speakers and taking questions, but I'm happy to take questions after. Oh, I did put up these. We will send around this deck and the links should work in there. If you guys want to explore this further, there, the big national conference on nonprofit news is June 9th and 10th. There are a lot of speakers. Um, Knight is leading a thing on community foundations and why they're funding news to strengthen their communities. Um, there are panels on a lot of efforts that we're also part of to build government support for news in a way that maintains independence, but there are many newspaper associations involved in that as well. So I invite you, it's free. Encourage you to just come explore um, and tap into the community. Um, on the INN Startup Guide, we will be adding a conversion quick guide to that. As Dan knows, we are trying to nail down a couple of IRS guidelines around how much advertising is okay before it can threaten your nonprofit status. So we're just trying to clarify a few things in this world that are fairly ambiguous before we put that out. But in a couple of weeks, we will have a conversion guide up as part of our startup guide. And Salt Lake Tribune also has a, a conversion playbook. Um, theirs is really good. It may be oriented to a little bigger papers. We're trying to um, address our quick guide is more the intro to that and also relevant to weeklies and small dailies. So um, that's it there. We also have startup sessions once a month you can dial into, and we do hear from a lot of newspapers in those as well as fresh startups. So thank you again. So um, a question came in for the audience here. And this might be for you, Dan, and Joe, feel free to speak in on this one as well. Um, but while you're selecting your, your board and finding your champions, what kind of people do you look for? So uh, uh, you could start that and then we yeah. can open it up to the board. That is a great question. Um, and you guys have an advantage in this. Most journalists, most startups, fresh startups are started by journalists and they in initially create a board of all journalists. And that's a big mistake right? They have the journalism chops themselves. So I think the functions you want on your board, first of all, don't go with the state minimum if it's three people. Your board, they're your strongest evangelists. They're your community connectors and often your funders. So you want people who are the movers and shakers in your community who can really build community support and also help you articulate this cultural shift. Because most people are like, what happened to my newspaper? It used to have news. They don't understand what happened to the ad market. They just think their newspaper shrunk. So there's a story to be told there, and you're going to need community help telling it. Again, this is not a failure of a small business. This is a global shift, and news is your asset as a community. So really strong communicators, evangelists. I would bring in nonprofit experience. I would also encourage you to get deeply involved in your state or local nonprofit association because you are entering a whole new field, right? It's And they are a wealth of information. So find a strong nonprofit news leader who can just help you cut through a lot of mysteries. Um, you may want some strong big name journalists, um, but it's as part of the mix. And then think about, do you want financial advice? Do you want HR? Like, what are the skill sets that can help you overall? Um, and many, many of our um, successful boards have uh, local lawyers are one well connected and can help navigate some of these things as well. So that's a that's a sample, but it depends on your community. But go broad, grab the people who will strengthen you and really communicate and be your evangelists. Dan, anything to add on that one? Um, I, I agree with the things Sue said. Um, 
this is a really critical process. Um, and um, it is a process in, in our case that I drove um, and gave it a lot of thought and listened to a lot of people say, tell me what sort of mix I'm looking for. Um, ultimately, I was looking for people who had a, a genuine passion for the various communities we cover and who saw the role of community journalism as essential to those communities. Um, we cover seven neighborhoods. Um, we are a racially diverse community. Um, and so we were looking actively to have a racially diverse board. Um, we were looking to certainly bring in people with nonprofit experience because that is something I do not have. And that has been invaluable. Um, but it's, it, you know, it, it's the passion because we're asking a lot of people for a lot of their, their, uh, energy and bandwidth to bring to this. We did not go out and look for the richest people in town. Um, our, our theory was that if we had a board that was strong and connected, that they would help us, um, with the introductions we needed to people of means. And that has uh, worked out well. Thank you, Dan. I'm going to add one thing um, just to anticipate. And you're all publishers, so this is not new, but it takes a new complexion with nonprofits. Sooner or later, you will write a story that hits close to home for a board member and that they don't like. Um, and so do know that that happens. I think for, for most organizations, there's two key things. One, set up a process so your board members do not go directly to your editors with story ideas. They're a font of story ideas. Don't turn them away, but create some separation. So they're going through you as the publisher or uh, you know, a kind of anonymous email. So your staffers, your editorial staffers don't feel pressured to do a story or change it because of the board, because the board is the closest thing to ownership in a nonprofit. Um, so that's one thing. And then two, just know you're going to anger a board member and sometimes they leave because they are frustrated with the coverage. Um, most of the time, they stay and people work it through and, and they value part of that passion is valuing the independence of the reporting. But you may at some point have to deal with a board member who just says, I didn't, I don't like this kind of coverage and, and leaves. When we wrote our bylaws 18 months ago, there is a firewall provision in the bylaws that separates the board from the newsroom. Matt, let me just jump in here, if I may, because one of the questions that I think, one of my favorite questions about nonprofits is whose organization is it? Ultimately, who has control of the organization? And if I'm an entrepreneur who has run my own business, mm -hmm. I certainly don't want to create a nonprofit which has a dozen people who can throw me out next year. And that is a real concern, I think, for mm -hmm. people who are creating nonprofits. There are ways to avoid that, which I'll talk about a little bit later. But I think that's a really critical issue. Another question came in on the, the board topic as a whole there, as you guys were speaking. Um, is the boards generally, and make sure I get this right, um, paid, volunteer? Like, how does compensation work for boards? Is there Does there need to be compensation? Um, I think I'm getting the gist of it there. If I'm not, please yeah. comment on there. But You actually, um, the... <laughs> Don can tell more about the, the term, but it's inurement. Um, boards cannot financially benefit from a nonprofit. Um, Unre unreasonably. They cannot unreasonably. benefit. Unreasonably. They yeah. can be paid for board service, but yeah. more than 90% of public charities do not pay their boards for, for their service on the boards. Great. That, that is a good answer to that question there. Um, Another question that came in, and this deals with probably board, and I think you've addressed that there, but also funders. How much impact do you find in nonprofits they have on the selection of investigative topics? And Dan, if you could maybe tackle that one there, since you're in the field there, um, how much do they have? Is there any impact? Is there some? Is there little from the funders or from 
um, from your board? For us, I would say the most um, direct example of that is that we have um, communities, well, every American community has issues related to race and equity. Um, certainly in our communities, that is a significant, complicated, fascinating topic that we have always covered over all of our years. Um, we were able to match the person who has a small family foundation and who was our largest funder at this point um, to create a restricted fund to pay for uh, equity coverage, equity in education. And so we recently were able to promote one of our staff writers to become our equity editor <laughs> and also to um, hire an additional full-time education reporter. And so that is something that is deep in our mission. And we were able to find a funder who had the same uh, passion. You know, again, I'm, I'm a rookie at this, um, but you know, the blessing is that um, while this is a restricted fund, this is not a heavy handed uh, micromanagement in any way. Um, you know, I've said, what, what documents do you need me to produce as the year goes on? And she says, I'll, I'll read the paper and I'll know you're doing the work. And uh, so that's, that's great. Um, and we're looking to create other uh, specialized beat funding around education, sustainability, uh, but have not gotten there yet. Sue, is that similar across the INN papers or is that different? Like what's your experience there? A couple of things. Where the money comes from does impact what you can cover. Um, so I think in a broad sense, if there are is a lot of funding for coverage of equity, then news organizations may do more of it. Same with education, environment, whatever the topic is. But generally, there is not interference from grant funders, and almost all grant agreements have a clause in them that they have no input uh, on the coverage whatsoever. There are a great set of guidelines from the American Press Institute, API, that I can send you to share after um, for funders and for journalists on where those boundaries are. And so you want to avoid taking funding that's down to I want coverage of this set of stories. They, you generally stop at a topic and they're trusting you and in, in not going into a more directive or narrowing it beyond that so it gets directive. But um, for-profits always worry about that. Like are these, are these foundations really shaping the coverage and in the five years I've been dealing with this, um, I think I've heard from two members that I can recall where the funder really, they were uncomfortable with the funder's level of engagement, but that's out of thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of grants. So it doesn't really come up. The foundations don't, they don't wanna get involved in your staffing or the details of your news coverage. Um, does that answer for you? I believe it does. If not, please, you know, the questioner can respond in the chat for more details there. Um, we'll take one more question here and then we'll move on to Don's portion of here. Um, so everyone remember, if you have questions, please post them in the chat to organizer and we'll pass them along to the group here. Um, the question we had coming soon, and this is pretty broad. I don't, we could probably spend days on it, but um, <laughs> where do we find funding? Oh, good question. It's the question, right? <laughs> it's the, the question in news overall. Um, that goes to building your broad community support. There are some national programs. We're involved in one of them, Newsmatch, that brings in national funding that matches the local contributions, individual donations you get locally. And that pours about 4 million from national foundations in. Interestingly enough, we're seeing it really be a catalyst local matching funds are now just about as big as the national. Um, there are national grants, particularly for coverage areas, but the foundations are really stumped about what to do. They need so many more nonprofit local outlets. The national foundations, even the giant ones like Knight, they can't fund 
3,000, 4,000, which is what we're probably going to need across the country at the local level at a meaningful rate. So ultimately it still does come down to building local support and that, it, and it's still real work. Um, but that does come in presenting to local community foundations, anybody who is a local funder. The other thing to do is invite philanthropists in your area to convene people, you know, start holding community discussions about what's happening to news and what news people want and start evangelizing. Even you don't even have to get into whether you're going to convert or not as a for-profit paper. Can you have an open public discussion about how the economics have changed in news? I know that feels scary. Your ad director may not want you to do it. Um, if you're thinking of trying to sell your paper, you may not want the broker you know, it may feel uncomfortable, but I, I honestly think it's the only route forward is to have this open discussion about the economics of news with your community and build that support. Um, once, in addition to reader revenue, converting papers are used to thinking that it, they think of a different flavor of subscription and it kind of is, but in nonprofits, the bulk of charitable funding comes not from foundations, but from individuals, but it's major gift individuals, those giving 5,000 and above. And so once you're starting to build support, knowing who has the means to give, introducing news to them as a cause, just like your local hospital and so forth is really, really important. Um, and I'll stop there because I suspect uh, Joe and Don and Dan have, have good insights into that. Yeah, open up. Uh, Don, Dan, anything you'd want to share on that topic of finding funders? I, I would um, say that it is um, a lot of work <laughs> and it is uh, something you got to be at every day. Um, and that and that it is, you know, in the, in the cultural shift that this is for those of us who've been doing this as for profit, you know, in my case, 40 years. It is, it is, um, there's got to be someone or a small group of people within your organization who are enthusiastic about going out and making this case, who want to have the conversations, who, um, who want to tell the story over and over again, and who are not uh, reluctant to make the ask. Um, you know, it's like trying to close a sale with the, um, you know, the car dealership is, you know, at some point you got to try to close the deal. Um, and for a lot of people, that's very awkward. And for those of us who came up on the editorial side, um, I think it's maybe particularly awkward, but it is a great gift you are offering to a community to potentially provide a way to create a really sustainable source of local independent news. And so you've got to be um, willing to make these connections. And, and you know, it, when I was two years ago, um, I came down to Houston for the um, INN days. It was, um, it was the best two days I've spent in journalism in years. Uh, it was a, a hotel filled with incredibly passionate people, uh, people passionate about journalism. It was a great lift, and it was a lot more fun than going to the Illinois Press Association convention and hearing a lot of old guys say, I wish it was 1987 again. Um, there was just this, this astounding energy in the room. Um, but I heard a speaker whose name I can't remember, Sue, who wrote a book um, called The Generosity Network. And it's the only book on fundraising I've ever read. And the main point that I took away from it was don't go in, don't feel like you're going in on bended knee, right. feel like you're going in to present someone who cares about your communities with an opportunity to be your partner in this work. Mm -hmm. um, it's very powerful. And I, I, you know, I, I, from our, from our very limited experience so far, um, our biggest category of funding is individuals, whether it's, you know, a subscriber adding 10 bucks onto their subscription as a donation, 
to you know people giving us substantially more money. It's all like everything else. It's a relationship that you're building. Joe, Don, anything to add? Yeah. Go ahead, Don. Well, I was just going to say there are there are a number of foundations which are particularly interested in funding journalism, and you should search them out. in In the Philadelphia area, there is now the Independence Public Media Foundation, which got $131 million from selling its uh, television broadcasting rights a couple of years ago. And its whole purpose now is to fund journalism. There's also the Lenfest Institute, which I'll talk about a little bit more later, which was created when Jerry Lenfest gave his, well, gave the Philadelphia Inquirer essentially to the Philadelphia Foundation in a hybrid kind of transaction. Uh, and they're funding journalism in a lot of different ways, particularly on the racial equity issues. And they're funding minority journalists to go to work for for-profit corporations <laughs> doing things like that. So there's a whole range of people. Community foundations are probably the best place to go because they're by definition interested in the community. And I'll talk about going there even if you're a for-profit because they can fund for-profits in this range as well. So there's a lot of opportunity, but it is work. And, and I think you're right, but ultimately it's the subscribers, the readers who are gonna be the bulk of the contributions. Right, now I'll add, it sort of um, adds to what Dan says, it's a, it is a learning process. And uh, what we've gone through, we've been very successful on gaining uh, individual support. Uh, we've been doing it for about a year. And in that year, we've gained about 2,500, roughly 2,500 donations. Uh, and they range from $2, somebody walking in the door and giving us two, two $1 bills to, um, you know, $5,000. And, but as we're, you know, learning, I'm not even gonna say we're maturing, we're not even close to that. Uh, it is, um, I'm finding that we have, uh, companies and individuals in our area, which we are categorizing as major gift prospects. And then the third one is foundations. And as Don pointed out, they can break down into national foundations as well as community foundations. And I haven't talked to any nationals, but we've talked to communities and they all seem to have an interest. Uh, it's not, it doesn't appear to be an, a dovetail fit into what their missions are, but there are, it appears that you know, they're interested in working with us uh, in and, and being creative about the types of funding that they can provide us. Great. Um, this is a great part of the topic, but I want to make sure we keep things moving here. So, uh, Don, um, I know you had a few points from your perspective that you wanted to share with the group, if you could yeah. pick up there. Yeah, I'm, I'm delighted to be here. I, I, I'm a journalism junkie, having edited my college daily and my law school weekly and having published a whole bunch of things while practicing law, including 30 years of a legal newsletter on nonprofit issues, nonprofit law issues. That's all online, which is only doable because it's online and not because, and because it's no longer a print vehicle. Um, but I think this is a particularly relevant topic because on Monday, Alden Global Capital purchased the Chicago Tribune and on Tuesday, they put $278 million of debt on the Chicago Tribune and its companies. Um, and they have a great you know, reputation of being aggressive cost cutters and taking money out of the publications before they sort of fall apart. Um, the one thing about the nonprofit journalism, whether it's directly nonprofit or hybrid or some other form, is that it takes that kind of economic incentive out of it because nobody can make an unreasonable compensation out of a nonprofit situation. And when you're dealing with a nonprofit situation, you're usually disclosing that kind of information. So it is, um, you know, it, it changes the whole situation. When Jerry Lenfest gave the Philadelphia Inquirer to an affiliate of the Philadelphia Foundation, his whole purpose in doing that was to try to keep investigative journalism in the Philadelphia area. And he knew that the Philadelphia Foundation would not have an incentive to sell its non-voting stock in that publication. So you know, that's given that kind of a, a stability that wasn't there before. And it doesn't have to sell out to the, you know, to the large hedge funds who want to 
milk the company out of its money. But I've been asked to sort of talk about the legal characteristics of nonprofits and some of the hybrids. Um, legal for, for nonprofits, we're talking about 501c3 charities, uh, normally public charities because it's got a range of, of income. Um, 501c3 charities can give deductibility to people who make contributions to that, to businesses, to individuals, uh, and they're the favored grantees of private foundations in particular. But there are trade-offs, and we have alluded to them, I guess, maybe somewhat today. But uh, one, a nonprofit organization may not endorse candidates for public office. Some papers have thought that was a big traditional important thing. Others have realized that maybe it wasn't so influential as they thought it was anyway, and they're willing to give it up. Um, the other issue is there's only a limited amount of lobbying that a charity can do. But I think my own view is that if a charity isn't lobbying, it's probably not doing its job at all. And that there's a lot broader range of lobbying that can be done. And by um, if you have a newspaper with a $500,000 budget, they can spend $100,000 on lobbying without going past their limit if they make the proper election. So there's a huge amount of, of space there. The real issue that I see for a lot of publications is the question of how much advertising revenue can you get that Sue mentioned. Because advertising revenue is normally considered unrelated business taxable income. And if you have too much unrelated business taxable income, you can lose your exempt status and you're not nowhere better off than you were before. Um, nobody knows where that line is. There is one case which says that a college alumni association, which got 95% of its revenue from unrelated travel activities, was still exempt because it did all of these other kinds of things and supported the alumni association and the university and helped raise money and had alumni reunions and seminars and all that kind of stuff. A very unusual case. The issue is you may not do have any substantial activity which is non-charitable. And the IRS tends to look at substantiality somewhere around 10 or 15 percent. Um, and that's tough. And if you have a free paper like Joe does, uh, which heavily relies on advertising to fund the printing and the distribution, um, you can't you can't be worried every day, it seems to me, as to whether or not that's going to be too much advertising. So um, that's a that's a real issue. The, the Supreme Court case on that is the Annals of Internal Medicine in Philadelphia, which was a publication for physicians, and all it ran was advertising about medical devices and drugs. And the U.S. Supreme Court said no. That's just the same advertising that goes in any publication and it's commercial activity and it's unrelated and you got to pay tax on it. Well, again, you know, if you have too much of that, you're really in trouble. Um, PBS has lived with sponsorships forever mm -hmm. and you may be able to get some sponsorships as a part of your publication, which are not advertising, but uh, that's a fine line to draw. And I think, you know, there's a distinction here between what you're doing online and what you're doing with physical papers. Um, the conversion process itself raises lots of tax issues, because if you just convert from for-profit to non-profit, the IRS treats that as a sale of the entity at fair market value. And that may be a taxable event, because the value of that publication you know, which is struggling because certainly last year it lost a whole lot of advertising, uh, may have to pay a capital gain tax now, or its shareholders may have to pay a capital gain tax now. So there are real issues to, to think about with that. I think there are also issues, if it's one thing to convert, it's another thing to dissolve the for-profit and give it to a charity. Uh, because then you've got to deal with all the contracts, the printing contracts, the you know vendor contracts, the leases, everything else that you have, which may not be assignable. So that's a thing to think about. It's not you know 
necessarily insurmountable, but it's the kind of thing which can be pretty difficult to deal with um, in, in its own situation. My own experience has not been in running nonprofit newspapers other than when I was in college, um, but we have dealt with two situations, one with the Philadelphia Inquirer, where the paper becomes, it stays as a business corporation, but it is owned by a charity or a group of charities. And that's the way the Lenfest Institute was created to own most of the interest in the Philadelphia Inquirer. The Inquirer runs separately uh, on itself as a business corporation. And Joe's situation, he has a charity, which is a fundraising vehicle, which I think he will agree really saved the paper last year when the advertising so totally disappeared. Um, but uh, it is now a fundraising vehicle. And um, I mentioned before the, um, some of the issues that the IRS was interested in when we applied for that exemption. And they wanted a little bit more activity, charitable educational activity by the foundation itself. So a lot of the kinds of events that nonprofits run that you're talking about, so will now be run by the foundation here and not by the paper itself. Um, but yet they're able to, to raise the, you know, in the interest, they raise, raise the interest to do it. Um, the uh, advertising issue is, is subsumed because the paper is still a for-profit and it can raise advertising. Uh, one of the things we will have to do, or Joe will have to do, uh, is on the 990 tax return of the foundation, we'll be reporting his salary from a related entity. We were talking before we started today about one of the issues about a nonprofit organization is that 990 tax return is incredibly informative and is the basis on which a lot of journalists begin to challenge what's going on in other charities, but now they're subject to the same kind of revelations. It talks not only about what everybody's salary is at the key levels, but it talks about conflict of interest transactions, talks about related party transactions, talks about a whole lot of different kinds of things that need to be dealt with. Um, if you have a situation like Joe does, he has to continue to raise money because if he becomes a private foundation for lack of public support, he will have to get rid of the newspaper. And that's not what he desires. But it's not that hard to continue to raise money from you know 50, even 50 or 100 people a year would be enough to keep it a publicly supported organization so it can continue to own the charity. So um, those are kinds of things that I think are important. We were talking earlier about where the money comes from. I think you want to be absolutely certain that you get a broad base of support. Uh, I think PBS, when they were attacked by, in Congress because they were getting most of their support from the government, and a lot of people in Congress didn't like the way they were reporting things. Uh, that's a real danger. And I think that you need to be sure that you have a very broad base of support uh, so that if you lose one or two or some here, you can continue basically on the same road. Um, we had talked about whose organization is it. You can set up, certainly in Pennsylvania and basically in every state, you can set up a nonprofit corporation, which is a membership corporation in which a single person or a, except New York or a few people who are the founders of the business can be the members, which are like shareholders of a business corporation, and they get to name and remove the directors. And the directors um, are there doing a job, doing a real job doing the evangelical job that we've talked about, but they're there subject to the control, ultimately, of the founders of the publication. And um, they can control that, and they can control the fact that the governing instruments can't be modified without their approval. So that's 
that's a traditional thing that we have used for charities to protect founders so they can't be thrown out as soon as it becomes successful. And uh, you know it can be used in this kind of situation as well. There are a couple other things which I, you know, we've talked about, or some people have talked about making it a B corporation, a benefit corporation. A B corporation is not a charitable, but the IRS does not recognize it as a charitable entity. So the gift giving that you're looking for in part of this is not available to a B corporation. Um, my reaction when Pennsylvania legislature apparently approved the B corporation unanimously in both houses was that it couldn't be terribly significant because nothing which goes through unanimously in both houses can be significant. Um, but it, it does legitimize by law the concept that there's a public policy and a public benefit uh, inherent in the business corporation, which I think was there anyway, but is now a little bit clearer. And as I mentioned before, I think that you can, even as a business corporation, try to get grants from community foundations or even private foundations for specific kinds of reporting. You know, the equity reporter, the cultural reporter that you didn't have before, some kind of coverage of the local governments that you didn't have before. Um, you can probably, you, you may be able to get funding for that even as a business worker. So it's not something that you have to necessarily go all the way uh, to become nonprofit or to be controlled by a nonprofit to make it happen, but it is available to you. So with that, I think, you know, happy to take any questions and, and let Dan talk about his actual experience. Yeah, we're gonna, um, I think we'll table questions for right now and uh, let Dan speak here um, about his experiences and kind of give those. And then afterwards, we'll open it up for um, questions for folks that are, that have them at that point. So Dan, if you don't mind going through some of um the pitfalls, the successes, you know, kind of those things that you saw that were um, from your experience going through 18 months ago and becoming a nonprofit. Well, I would, I would start by saying, thank God we did what we did when we did it um, because of the impact of COVID on advertising. Um, so we're, we're glad we made the decision that we made. I would just, you know, echo some of the things that have been said. Um, this is a, a different legal entity. It is a different cultural entity. And you need to be really as attuned to those things as you can be. Um, there are internal and external aspects to this. And that's, um, you know, we, we are a company that is a lot smaller than we once were. Um, and we have a staff that, you know, has some shell shock from the diminishment of flags over the years. Um, and so how you communicate this internally is really important, uh, just as it is externally. Um, so you need to really think about what's the story that you want to tell to the community? Uh, what's the story you want to tell to staff, um, to potential advertisers? I would go back to something Sue said at the beginning. It is not a story of your business failure. It is a it is a massive change in how journalism is funded. Um, and what you are presenting to people is a bold and innovative um, approach to trying to um, um, salvage and, and make local news thrive. Um, it's a positive story and it's a, it's a hopeful story. People who you are talking to about making donations, whether it's a small donation or a large donation, they want to hear your future oriented story. They don't want to hear your worries about paying your print bill. Um, they don't want to pay your print bill. They want to pay for the future, not, not the past. Um, endorsements have come up. Um, endorsement, so the, the I, Don, I, I find the IRS is fairly vague in a lot of ways. One of the ways they are clear is no endorsements. Uh, for us, that was a that was a big uh, mind shift because we we take our endorsements seriously over the years. 
um, even though for many years we called them the kiss of death for most candidates. Um, but one of the things that we have found is that um, it is, and partly we just came into a major election season locally. The, the absence of endorsements is probably the way that people first grasp the changes that we made to nonprofit most directly. We heard about um, this a lot from readers who, who wanted our endorsements back. Um, instead, what we did is we just really heavied up on election related information and biographies and profiles um, and then served up a lot of that. I get sick sometimes of telling the story of what we're doing. And um, I feel like I am battering people over the head with it in columns and newsletters and emails. And then I find out that half the people I talk to have no idea what we've done. And it's like, tell the story some more. Um, you just have to keep repeating the story. Um, the IRS um, application um, is a real process and you need real expertise and advice from lawyers and accountants um, who specialize in this work. We were fortunate and found good people. Um, we've just completed our first audit and tax return as a nonprofit. That is a mind expanding experience. Um, and for those of us who have you know, run our companies um, with integrity, but um, entrepreneurial um, drive over the years, it is, it's a moment when the auditor says, tell us, uh, show us the paperwork on this 3% um, pay raise you gave someone last year. And it's like, my recollection is I walked past the business manager and said, give this person 3% more next week. And uh, that's not gonna work anymore. So you gotta, you gotta adapt. Um, there are um, conflict of interest policies, whistleblower policies, uh, document retention policies. You gotta pay attention to the details as you go along. Um, something Sue said is something that we have really experienced. People perceive you differently. Once you are a nonprofit, they do feel a sense of ownership. Sometimes that's positive. Sometimes you'd like to slap them and say, you know, get out of my business. Um, don't do that, um, but you wanna feel that sometimes. People feel a sense of this is in a, in a more real way, a community asset. And if we're going out and saying, you know, we're like the, um, you know, we're like the, um, the food pantry and the local hospital looking for money, then we've got to accept that we are a community asset and act like it. Um, something I, I say, internally is um, we are on a path here and the path is uncertain. Um, we believe this is for us and for a lot of independent community newspapers, the best possible path to be on. But it's not assured. It's gonna take a whole lot of work. Uh, we gotta learn a lot. Um, it's also very gratifying when someone walks in with $2 bills and gives them to you. Um, I was writing thank you letters last week to hundreds of our donors, and um, the first one was the smallest one, and it was a $2 add-on to a subscription renewal. It is very gratifying to see the relationship that we and that all of you have built in your communities and to see it come around in this way. Um, so I, I think this is the path. Um, and I, I welcome the chance to talk to anyone else or answer questions. So we're, we're closing out of time, but we have some a uh, few questions. I'm hoping the group can answer here. Um, one, I think this is probably Don, but you know, feel free to interject there. And there's, I'm hoping there's a simple answer on this, but I have found from today's discussion there's not a lot of simple answers. Um, can a subscription be a donation? So by getting subscribing to the paper, can it be a tax deductible donation for the subscriber? Only if you say the subscription is worthless. Check. You, you can only get a donation when you get goods and services in return if you give more than the value of the goods or services. So basically, no. Um, 
you know, you're buying a service, you're buying a publication and you're paying the subscription price and that's, you know, not deductible as a charitable contribution. One of the things I would say about charitable contributions, although people talk about them all the time, there's only now about 7% of US taxpayers who actually itemize their deductions and everybody else just uses the standard deduction so that, but for the fact that Congress in the last year and next year allowed a $300 deduction for taxpayers, basically there's not an economic benefit in the kinds of relatively small donations that I think people are looking at to support this you know, operation. For larger- add into that though, that um, you know, nonprofits were really worried about that loss of the deduction and it did not devastate giving. There is a strong tradition of giving and I think it's still more than half of donations are given on the last day or two of the year that dates to getting it in by that tax deadline, it's now a habit in our culture. Um, mm -hmm. So we do see that continuing. The other thing that from, um, it's only a handful of our organizations that have subscriptions and donations, but they will see that people will give more than they will when they're subscribing or they'll top up a subscription with a donation and, um, Pew or Knight did an interesting study. Or, no, I'm sorry. I think I misspoke. I think it was Gallup. But they did find younger people are less likely to subscribe, but more likely to donate. Older Americans are still, you know, oriented to subscriptions. So we're seeing a behavior shift, but it's very early to understand how that plays out. Uh, so we have one last question here I want to pose to the group um, and, and get your responses back on this. And it may be short, maybe long, I'm not sure. Um, Sue, I'll start with you on this one. But Dan had brought up the, the importance of finding uh, counsel and accountants when you're starting this process. Where do you recommend papers who are interested in starting that process look? Like, where should they be sourcing yeah. that? It's a good question. Um, accounting is not that difficult because there is a whole field of not-for-profit accountants who can help you make those conversions. Um, and we have some resources in terms of, you know, sample Excel sheets. And the biggest accounting issue that we see is actually in grant applications. When people apply for grants, they apply for the reporting costs you actually have a whole array of costs, right? Your editing costs, your that, and people will forget to put that in. Um, but accounting simpler. On the legal side, um, <laughs> I think it is tricky. There, find somebody like Don, find, there are a handful of people, and I think we have a handful listed on our site. There's a lawyer in San Francisco. There's the lawyers who worked with Salt Lake. Um, and lend fast, but there's really only a handful at this intersection of news and nonprofits. So there's a lot of general legal advice about nonprofits, but in these issues that Don covered that are mobile, where you're really trying to read the IRS tea leaves, um, it can help to find an attorney who's working in that field. And then as, as well as, um, Don, you may have a better idea than I do of how important it is to go to a specialist in terms of your selling or donating all those transition efforts. Like asking a surgeon whether you need a specialist or not. Yeah. No, obviously you do. Yeah. So uh, I would I would look around. I would talk to the people who have converted, um, check with us. And then we we are trying to get Trust Law, which is a nonprofit run by the Thomson Reuters Foundation to actually do a white paper on all of these advertising issues. So I don't know yet. We don't, they're, they're very interested in it. We don't know yet if they're going to do it. But the thing that I would say is find the specialists, find the people who have done it because the advice we're seeing people get all over the country is wildly varied from good lawyers. You know, it's in good faith. Well, it's, it's, there's no precise answer. One of the issues that we were worrying, questioning whether or not a local newspaper 
can claim that local advertising uh, is part of its program service revenue because the local people want to know about the pizza shop in my town and they don't want to advertise in the Chicago Tribune for the whole region at those rates. Now, of course, you can go on you know, the cable company and advertise almost by block, but um, you know, there, there is an argument to be made that part of the community connector argument, if that's what your if that's what your purpose is as a community connector, part of that local advertising could be program related. But you know, that's an argument and not a fact. Right. And we find our members, several of our members have long considered advertising part of their mission, not unrelated business income. They haven't been called on it. The IRS is overwhelmed, so I don't know if it's just that they haven't looked at it as more newspapers convert. Might they? There also are a lot of bills moving through Congress right now that might make it easier to declare subscriptions, local support, well, look at some of the advertising subscriptions issues. Are, subscriptions are like paying to go to the opera or paying to go to the museum. That's program related. Right. In, and there's no question that that's public support and it's perfectly legitimate. And the more that you get, the better. But advertising has got its own history and there are very few situations which advertising has been permitted as program related. They do that for county law journals and apparently they do that for college newspapers because the educational mission of the college newspaper is different from the journalistic mission. And so they've argued that that, and they've taken it as program-related investment. I looked it up last night just to see. Oh, interesting. That's very interesting. Don, any, or Dan, any suggestions from your side when you found, after your experience, finding uh, help in your process? I, I would uh, agree with Sue that the uh, accounting side is simpler. And so we switched from the um, for-profit to non-profit side of the accounting firm we have used for 20 years. Um, the attorney, um, you know, we obviously have had attorneys over the years, um, but we went out and found a non-profit attorney in Chicago, um, does not have experience in the uh, journalism conversion field. Um, you know, when we did this two years ago, we were, as far as I know, the first conversion like this in Chicago area anyhow. So it's not like there's a lot of lawyers who've been doing this, but I, I think it is incredibly vital to have someone you have confidence in. Well, thank you. We are at time at this. We've ran a little bit over. So I do appreciate the indulgence of all of our speakers giving a little bit more time today and for our attendees staying on because I think everyone here finds this immensely valuable and those who will be watching the recording later will also find everything that Sue and Dan and Don and, and Joe, thank you for interjecting as well, have shared um, for today's panel on nonprofits and the intersection of news, because as we've talked about today, it's an important topic for us to go over. So again, thank you for everything you shared. Thank you for all of our attendees coming to this uh, edition of the Pennsylvania News Media Association's uh, community newspaper forum, where we had a chance for folks to ask questions of experts and for you to respond and share valuable information. We'll follow up with some of the information shared today as well as the video in the coming days. So stay tuned. And again, thank you to everyone for attending today.